This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. When it becomes clear that there's overwhelming evidence of a person's guilt in the commission of a heinous crime, the defense team may decide their best bet to defend their client is to come up with a creative excuse for the accused's actions. I visited this topic before when I detailed cases in which the perpetrator denied they should be held legally responsible with excuses that varied from they were sleepwalking at the time of the offense, or their privileged upbringing kept them from learning right from wrong, or even that they were under the influence of Twinkies, yes, the junk food snack cake, which caused them to lose all reason. While these types of defenses receive an A for effort in the courtroom, there is one type of creative defense that never fails to fascinate. When the accused claims their crimes were committed while possessed by a demon, or even Satan himself. This defense is not as rare as you may think. I found several interesting cases employing this strategy in the courtroom. Since this is October, the spookiest month of the year, I thought I'd bring a couple of these stories to you in a series I've titled, The Devil Made Me Do It. In this first episode, a teenager takes the life of family members as well as a random stranger and then claims his involvement in satanic rituals led him to murder. Was 16-year-old Sean Sellers demon-possessed, mentally ill, or simply a cold-blooded killer? John Richard Seller's early life was one of constant change and little stability. He was born to 16-year-old Vonda Blackwell in Corcoran, California, on May 18, 1969. His father, Richard Sellers, was only in his life briefly, and Vonda raised her baby boy with the help of her parents, Dina and Carlos Lindley. Sean became close to his grandfather, Carlos, who took him hunting and fishing. But when Sean was just five years old, his maternal grandmother, Dina, died. Vonda then moved from California to Oklahoma to live with her father, Jim Blackwell, and his wife, Geneva, who Sean called Papa and Grandma. Soon after moving to McAllister, Oklahoma, Vonda, now 21 years old, met 31-year-old Paul Leon Belofato. Belofato, who was called Lee, was a Green Beret combat vet who'd served in Vietnam. He was living in McAllister and working as an Army recruiter when he met Vonda. Within a year, Lee married the young mother. Lee started working as a long-haul truck driver, and Vonda began accompanying her new husband on his trips across the country. Sean, now in kindergarten, stayed behind living with his grandparents. Lee and Vonda returned every few weeks, and Sean eventually went to live with his mother and stepfather in Oklahoma City. As Lee was the only father Sean had really known, he soon began calling him dad. At times, however, when Lee and Vonda went back on the road, Sean was shuffled to various relatives on both sides of his family. Sean would later say that around the age of six, he began hearing voices in his head. It does not appear that he experienced these as auditory hallucinations. Instead, he'd later describe them as internal thoughts directed by an invisible outside force or entity. These voices directed his actions by giving him commands. Some of these commands were innocuous, but at other times, Sean was instructed to break rules set by his parents or do other things he knew were wrong. He felt compelled to obey, Sean recalled, and then would be spanked or otherwise punished for his actions. The voices also criticized him relentlessly. Sean didn't tell anyone about hearing these voices. Since they'd begun when he was still so young, he believed they were just a normal part of life. When Sean was eight years old, he moved to Los Angeles with his mother and stepfather. For a time, they lived with Lee's sister, Terry, in an apartment in the city. Growing up in Oklahoma, Sean was used to having a lot of space to run around outside and play, but in Los Angeles, he was mostly confined to the apartment, which was already cramped with too many people. He recalled his mother yelling at him a lot more during this time for making too much noise. Sean became isolated while living in California. He didn't fit in with the other kids, many of whom were Latino or African American, and who made fun of and bullied him. As a kid from Oklahoma, he didn't fit in with these city kids, and took to spending most of his time alone. He also said that during his time in Los Angeles, 
he was molested by an older relative whom he never named. He told no one about this abuse, partly, he said, because the voices in his head made him believe that it had been his fault. Sean and his family didn't remain long in Los Angeles, but soon returned to Oklahoma. Lee and Vonda then went back on the road. Sean stayed with his grandparents again, but his mother and stepfather returned periodically. Often, after they returned, Sean would be moved again to another town and another school. By the age of 16, he had moved over 30 times. Sean had stopped making friends, trying to avoid the sadness that inevitably came at having to say goodbye once more. Instead, he created an internal fantasy life to keep him company. In this way, the boy became more isolated and, some would later say, began to lose touch with what was real and what was fantasy. At around the age of 12, Sean was introduced to the fantasy role-playing game Dungeons & Dragons. This game allowed each player to create their own character and embark on adventures and quests steeped in the world of fantasy and sorcery. Dungeons & Dragons, or D&D as it's commonly called, received criticism from some parenting groups as it became more popular. Some Christian groups claimed D&D promoted practices like devil worship, witchcraft, suicide, and even murder. They cautioned that the game endangered impressionable young players who would be led into such activities. Players of the game were often falsely accused of involvement in Satanism and the occult. Another interest of Sean's as a preteen was the Japanese martial art known as ninjutsu. He was introduced to it by an 18-year-old cousin who lived with Sean and his family for a time. Ninjutsu, historically, involved unconventional warfare including guerrilla tactics and the use of stealth to sneak up on unsuspecting enemies. Sean was introduced to books that illustrated these types of assassination techniques. As a boy, he began taking martial arts lessons, but was ridiculed for it by his stepfather and uncle, who were both army veterans and had, quote, experienced real war. They told stories about killing enemies during wartime, and according to Sean, characterized killing as easy under these conditions. Sean wanted to be accepted as a, quote, real man by his male relatives, but often felt he didn't measure up. The sensitive boy was often teased and told not to act like a baby by the older men in his family. In 1983, when Sean was just entering his teen years, Lee moved with his family to Greeley, Colorado. He ended his truck driving job and began working in construction. Sean began high school in Colorado and joined the Civil Air Patrol program. Sean loved the structure and discipline of the organization and threw himself into his new activity. He worked his way up the ranks and was promoted to cadet commander of his squad. In the Civil Air Patrol, Sean felt like he belonged for the very first time in his life, and his accomplishments also earned his stepfather's pride and respect. So naturally, he was devastated when he was informed they were moving back to Oklahoma. Lee had been offered a steady job there in the construction industry, and they'd be able to finally put down roots in one place. But this good news came just a little too late for Sean, who was happy in Colorado and had found a sense of purpose. He begged his parents to let him stay in Colorado but as a child, he had no say in the matter and was uprooted once more. He would later say that after this time, he stopped caring about anything and fell into depression. Back in Oklahoma City, Sean was now a sophomore at Putnam City North High School. Although he was extremely bright and had always done well in school, teachers and classmates saw a change in Sean Sellers now. His grades slipped, and he began exhibiting strange behaviors. Having felt controlled by adults all his life, Sean found a dramatic way to rebel. He soon befriended a female classmate who shared with him her interest in witchcraft. He embraced this interest and was especially drawn to spells and rituals outlined in books about witchcraft. This led him to read and learn about the supernatural and occult practices. He obtained a copy of Anton LaVey's Satanic Bible, which, in his estimation, he read over 100 times. Over time, he coddled together a hodgepodge of these ideas, philosophies, and practices into his own version of what he called Satanism. Sellers would say that these rituals provided him with the freedom and control he'd never experienced before. He now made up his own rules to live by and rejected those formally set for him by his parents, society, and the Christian church. His family had never been regular churchgoers, but living in Oklahoma, in the heart of America's Bible Belt, 
the moral code of the Christian worldview was prevalent. Sellers began performing rituals on a regular basis. He now decided that the voices he'd been hearing in his head for most of his life were the voice of demons. Suddenly, Sean said, it all made sense to him. Following the guidance of these voices coming to him from the dark side gave him a sense of purpose and power, instead of making him feel like an outcast. To make it official, he performed a ceremony with some of his new friends, renouncing God and Christ and pledging to serve only Satan. He began wearing all-black clothing and carrying a copy of the Satanic Bible around school. He no longer cared about his appearance and often arrived at school dirty and unkempt. He also wore a vial of his own blood around his neck that he sometimes drank from. It was rumored that he ate a frog's leg in biology class. All of these odd behaviors caused him to be bullied, ridiculed, and ostracized by the majority of his classmates. Sean no longer cared. He started taking speed or methamphetamines to stay awake at night. He wanted this time to perform his rituals without interference. These rituals seemed to quell his anxiety by providing him with a sense of control over his own life for the first time. But Sellers soon became obsessed with these practices to the point where he started to feel more anxious and depressed. He even admitted to a teacher and his mother that he felt like he was, quote, going crazy. He tried to stop performing these rituals, he later said, but felt powerless to do so. Upon returning to Oklahoma, Sellers had reconnected with a former classmate. Richard Howard and Sean had previously bonded over Dungeons and Dragons and now switched their mutual interest to the occult. Together, they immersed themselves even more into occult practices and egged each other on in these pursuits. The two teenagers started discussing committing crimes and violent acts to prove their, quote, allegiance to Satan. They also discussed revenge fantasies. Richard, Sellers later claimed, talked about wanting to rape and kill an ex-girlfriend. They also discussed a plan to take a former boss of Richard's by surprise as she made her usual trip to drop off cash in the bank's night slot. Sellers, they decided, would use his ninja skills to sneak up on her and kill her so they could steal the cash and split the money. In the summer of 1985, the two boys each pledged that they would commit a murder. Richard planned to kill his girlfriend's father, who he alleged had beaten her after catching her on the phone with him late one night. Sellers' victim, it was decided, would be a random stranger, a night cashier who worked at a remote Circle K convenience store. Robert Bauer was a 32-year-old man who worked the night shift and whom Richard had gotten to know. He often stopped at the store on his way home from visiting his girlfriend and knew that Bauer worked alone. In the first week of September 1985, Sellers and Richard stopped at the Circle K when Bauer was on duty. Richard attempted to get Bauer to sell him some beer, but he refused since the boys were not of legal drinking age. That's when they decided it was time to carry out their plan. A few nights later, on September 8th, the boys returned to the convenience store. They had brought along a 357 Magnum that belonged to Richard's father and a rifle that was the property of Richard's brother. Both boys entered the store, purchased soft drinks, and began talking to Bauer. They spent about an hour with him talking about cars and other things. At one point, they asked the clerk if he wasn't worried about being robbed, noting that there were no cameras monitoring the store. Bauer said he wasn't, since there was never more than $50 cash left inside the register at any one time, and, quote, no one's going to kill me over $50, end quote. The boys exchanged smirks upon hearing Bauer say this. Richard lured Bauer outside to take a look at the clutch work he just had done on his car. The plan was, when he re-entered the store, Sellers would sneak up behind him and shoot him in the head. But as the cashier returned, Sellers froze. Quote, I couldn't do it, just couldn't, Sellers later admitted. Then this voice spoke inside my head and said I was weak, I was a coward, and something blinked inside my mind. That's the only way I can describe it. One second I was shaking and saying I couldn't do it, and then blink. I was cold, determined, heartless, and evil. I walked back around straight and tall, opened the door and stepped in. I raised the gun over the counter, aimed it at his head, and just as he looked at me, fired. He flinched and it missed. He ran and I fired again, but he slipped and fell and I missed again. I heard him cry out though. He grabbed a green windbreaker which he wore when stocking the walk-in refrigerators and held it up in both hands hiding behind it as he ran bent over back and forth behind the counter. 
Richard came up to the counter, and he ran from him and almost in to me. I saw his eyes over that jacket filled with panic, and I heard Richard say, Do it! I fired, and Robert Paul Bauer flew backward, landing hard on his side. Blood splattered everywhere. He didn't move. When I turned around, Richard was leaning over the counter trying to figure out how to open the cash register. I said, Go! but he didn't move. I took a few steps and said, go, and he sprang out the door. We got in the car and left. In the car, we laughed about it, end quote. A few minutes after Sellers and Richard left the store, customers arrived to find the cashier shot dead. One of the customers happened to be a nurse, and she tried to revive Bauer, but it was of no use. He was gone. Nothing had been taken from the store, and leads regarding Bauer's killer soon dried up. There were no viable suspects identified, and it appeared that the murder would go unsolved. I live in Northern California, the heart of wine country, and if you're a wine drinker like I am, you know that just in this region alone, the options are limitless. I can even peruse the wine aisle of my favorite grocery store and find dozens, if not hundreds, of wines to choose from. But actually enjoying a wine I've chosen can sometimes be hit or miss. Who knows if it's going to suit my particular palate once it's opened up. But now, as a First Leaf Wine Club member, you can be sure to get only hits. That's because the experts at First Leaf work with your personal palate and send wines chosen especially for you right to your door. First Leaf is a wine club that curates and ships wines that are perfect for you And since they work with renowned winemakers the world over, you'll get to experience a variety of wines you may not have had the chance to before. After you've tried the wines, First Leaf has you rate them. Tell them what you liked, what you didn't like, and what you absolutely loved, and they will continue to fine-tune your selections to make sure you fall in love with virtually every bottle of wine you receive. How great is that? And here's a secret. First Leaf works directly with winemakers to get you 60% off retail on some incredible wines. With a First Leaf subscription, I've found that I love some wines from other regions and countries that I might have missed out on without their excellent picks just for me. First Leaf is so confident you'll love the wine that they have a 100% satisfaction guarantee. If you receive a bottle that's not exactly what you were hoping for, First Leaf will credit your account. Join today and you'll get six bottles of wine for just $29.95 and free shipping. To get this special offer, go to tryfirstleaf.com slash once. That's six bottles of wine for $29.95 plus free shipping at tryfirstleaf.com slash once. Six months after randomly killing a perfect stranger, Sean Sellers was battling with his mother at home. Sellers had met a new girl named Angel and fallen in love. His mother, Vonda, however, did not approve of his new love interest. My mom hated her, Sellers later stated. Vonda badmouthed his girlfriend, calling her a dropout, a tramp, and a loser, according to Sean. He and his mother got into frequent arguments about the relationship, with Vonda refusing to let him see her. Sean became more angry and once even got into a physical altercation with his mother, pushing her. Sellers then tried to run away from home, staying one night at a friend's house, before his stepfather Lee showed up, took away his truck keys, and forced him to return home. He became increasingly angry at his mother, and now tried to cause her harm by putting rat poison in her coffee. Somehow, Sellers would later say, the poisoning had no effect on her. In school, Sellers completed an English assignment by writing about his belief in Satanism and its positive effects on his life. Quote, Satanism made me a better person. I am free. I can kill without remorse, Sellers wrote. His teacher turned the paper over to Sean's mother. Sellers said he'd begun having frequent dreams about killing and mutilating people. In order to stay awake so he wouldn't suffer these terrible nightmares, Sellers took more speed. He also smoked marijuana to deal with his feelings of, quote, pure cold hatred, according to Sellers' later confessions. Sellers would describe his jumble of thoughts, feelings, and emotions during this time as blinks. Quote, I'd feel this hatred for people, especially my mother, but after that, blink, and everything was different. We argued, but I just wanted to leave. I didn't want to kill her. Then blink, and I'd be planning her death. One night that blink happened, and when I came home from work, I was the cold murderer who had killed Robert Bauer. End quote. 
On the night of March 4th, Sellers had been up for three days. He performed a ritual and then retrieved a 44 caliber revolver belonging to his stepfather. Quote, I put the gun close to Dad's head and fired, then immediately fired again at Mom's head. Her head raised up, neck craning backward, and I fired again. Then I laid the gun down in the hallway and went back to the room. I felt relieved. I felt like a great weight had been taken off my shoulders. I went to take a shower, and then the blinking started again. There was a lot of blinking, so much so that nothing is clear. I ended up at Richard's house, and we planned what to do for the police. But it wasn't all an act. There would be a blink, and I'd cry real tears in real grief. Then another blink, and I was calm and cold and putting on a show." End quote. After killing his parents in their bed, Sellers went to Richard's house and told him what he'd done. His friend helped him hide the gun, and they came up with a plan. Sellers would say he spent the night at a friend's, and then in the morning, pretend he'd returned home to find his parents shot inside the house. The next morning, Sellers was witnessed running out of his house screaming that his parents had been shot. Police arrived and discovered the murder scene, but something about the boy's story rang false, and he quickly became their main suspect. Upon being interviewed by homicide detectives, Richard Howard immediately cracked and told the police his friend Sean had confessed to murdering his parents. Both boys were soon linked to the murder at the Circle K. After an investigation, both Richard Hauer and Sean Sellers were charged with Robert Bauer's murder. But Howard made a deal to testify against his friend, and in exchange was given only a five-year suspended sentence. 16-year-old Sean Sellers was arrested for the first-degree murder of Lee and Von de Bellafato, as well as Robert Paul Bauer. The district attorney immediately released a statement saying he planned to try Sellers as an adult. The state would also seek the death penalty. Sellers, the district attorney stated, was deserving of the death penalty for the cold and calculated crimes he had committed and his stated motivation for the murders. The media reported that the 16-year-old killer was a practicing Satanist who told his friend he shot Robert Bowers simply to discover what it felt like to kill someone. As for his parents, According to the DA, Sellers was angry that they had forbidden him from dating a girl he liked. Sean Sellers' trial began in 1986 when he was 17 years old. The state was seeking the death penalty for the baby-faced blonde boy who had murdered three people in cold blood. The DA laid out the case for the jury in the harshest terms possible. Sean Sellers was an avowed disciple of Satan, he told the predominantly Christian jury. He had embraced evil in serving his demonic master and killed a 32-year-old stranger in pursuit of a thrill killing. The state put Sellers' one-time best friend on the stand, who told the jury that Sellers had told him before killing the store clerk that he wanted to, quote, see what it felt like to murder. Sellers' defense also identified him as a practicing Satanist but attempted to use this as a way to show that he was not in his right mind at the time of the murders. Sellers' attorney, Steve Presson, explained that he was under the influence of demonic possession, and this had caused him to do the unthinkable. He also claimed as part of the defense that Sellers was addicted to the game Dungeons and Dragons, which had led him to become involved in Satanism. His judgment of good and evil, right and wrong, had been warped at the time of the murders, his attorney said. While we may find it ridiculous that Sellers' defense tried to convince a jury that Satan, practicing witchcraft, and or Dungeons and Dragons were to blame for an otherwise normal teenager planning and carrying out three murders, it's important to note that this crime and trial took place in the midst of what we've come to call the Satanic Panic in the United States. The book Michelle Remembers, a quote, first-person account of an adult's recall of being abused by a Satanic cult, was released in 1980. It became a bestseller, and people began believing that ritual abuse was taking place in their communities. The McMartin preschool trial also took place in the mid-1980s, after several caregivers of a California preschool were accused of subjecting dozens of preschoolers to ongoing satanic ritual abuse. Over 100 preschools across the country were also accused of satanic ritual abuse by other parents after the McMartin case became a lead story. Just a few years after Sean Sellers' case was tried in Oklahoma, less than 500 miles away, three other teens would be accused of murdering three little boys in West Memphis, Arkansas. Damian Eccles, Jesse Miscalli, and Jason Baldwin 
would be tried and convicted of this crime, and Eccles was sentenced to death. They were accused of killing Stevie Branch, Christopher Byers, and Michael Moore as part of a satanic ritual. By the time of Sean Sellers' 1986 trial, the perceived danger of hordes of satanic cult members wreaking havoc in good, God-fearing Christian communities was firmly implanted in the minds of the American public. Amidst this culture of fear, Sellers' defense's attempt to characterize his involvement in satanic practices as a way to defend him of his crimes claiming he was mentally ill was a hard sell at best and a foolhardy strategy at worst. It took the jury less than three hours to find the defendant guilty of three counts of first-degree murder and fix their recommendation as death. At the time of Sellers' conviction, juries in the state of Oklahoma were not given the option of handing down a life sentence without the possibility of parole. It was later reported that some jurors believed if they had recommended Sellers serve a life sentence, he may be set free in as little as 7 to 14 years. One juror also stated it was her belief Sellers would never actually be put to death anyway, since an execution had not occurred in the state of Oklahoma for over 20 years. The death penalty, as it was then administered, was ruled unconstitutional by the United States Supreme Court in 1972. Changes were enacted, and the death penalty was reinstated in 1976. However, sentencing a person to death for crimes committed before the age of 18 is rare. Sean Sellers was the first in the state of Oklahoma. He was sent to the Oklahoma State Penitentiary in McAllister, a maximum security prison. His secure unit was located underground, and he spent 23 hours a day in his cell. An automatic appeal of his sentence was filed. Not long after his arrest and trial, Sean Sellers claimed he had turned away from Satanism and become a born-again Christian. His step-grandfather, Carlos Lindley, remained a supporter and believed his grandson was sincere. Others, however, were skeptical. They saw it as a self-serving manipulation Sellers used in hopes of having his death sentence overturned. Nevertheless, Sellers' story of The Devil Made Me Do It fascinated the public, and he was soon asked to share his tale with viewers of The Oprah Winfrey Show, 48 Hours, and Geraldo. Sellers embraced his new role as living proof of the dangers of dabbling in the occult. His dramatic transformation from a straight-A student to one who would murder his own parents to please Satan was must-see TV at the time. His story was even made into a feature-length documentary titled Stuck in a Nightmare, The Sean Sellers Story. Sean himself appears in it to warn others not to make the mistakes he did and to choose a life lived for Jesus and not Satan. Satan doesn't play games, Sellers states in the documentary. People start out with Dungeons and Dragons, tarot cards, and Ouija boards. There are powers working around those things that people just don't understand, end quote. You see me, you see these handcuffs, you see where I'm at. This is where Satanism put me. You've heard the stories of other kids where Satanism put them. And it's not the way. Wise up. Listen to what I'm saying. I'm not I'm not some preacher on some pedestal. I'm talking from experience. I've been there. I've walked where you are. Listen to what I'm saying. Jesus Christ is the only way. And he's waiting for you with open arms. If you would just let him into your life and give him a fair chance. Sellers wasn't allowed internet access while in prison, but he wrote hundreds of pages detailing his life story, his downfall after indulging in these types of activities, and his new life in Christ, where he professed to feeling free for the first time ever, even while sitting in a death row cell. His motivation for sharing his story, he said, was in order to help others who may be feeling lost and turn to the wrong things like he did to find a sense of purpose. His story attracted many strangers who became his supporters. They began a website for him, seansellers.com, posting his autobiography, poems, sermons, and other writings. The journal entries where he details the murders are written in brutal honesty and are chilling to read. He admits to laughing after killing Robert Bauer and shares in graphic detail the damage the bullet made to his mother's face after he shot her. Sellers' court appeal included a 1992 report provided by mental health experts who examined Sean Sellers after his conviction. During his initial trial, the defense was provided only $750 to cover any expert witness testimony plus travel costs and other expenses. At trial, the jury heard from Sellers' friends and acquaintances that they saw no evidence of mental illness before or after the murders. But the 1992 psych report told a different story. Sellers provided more information about his childhood to doctors after he was incarcerated, 
and they now reported a history of childhood physical abuse, emotional abuse, and neglect. Outlined were the dozens of times Sellers was uprooted from different homes and placed with relatives beginning at the age of two or three. This was said to be a factor in the mental illness that was now diagnosed. Sean also shared that he'd been subjected to physical abuse by his mother, Vonda. She would become frustrated with him for minor things any child might do, like making a mess or being noisy, and would hit him with a belt, a hairbrush, wooden spoons, or anything else close by she could grab, Sean claimed. He said he was often hit in the head with these objects or fists. Regarding how he felt about his mother, Sean replied that he, quote, both loved and hated her. He also told of being subjected to humiliation by male family members. His uncle James, Lee's brother, would ridicule him because he wet the bed. His uncle would then make him wear a diaper the next day. If it happened a second time, he'd force Sean to wear the diaper on his head. He was also taken hunting by his uncle, who showed him how to kill animals in a particularly cruel and gruesome way, Sean claimed. Sean said his uncle had him step on a raccoon or other wild animal's head and pull on its limbs until they tore off. Sean recalled witnessing the animal's head sometimes being pulled off during these displays. If he refused to participate, he said he was made fun of by his uncle and stepfather and called a wimp. He also described hiding his emotions when his mother would leave him with a relative and head back on the road once again with Lee. As a young boy, he wouldn't let his parents see him cry, holding it in until after they left, lest they become angry or make fun of him, Sellers said. He now described blackout periods he'd experienced during his life, what he called blinks in the previous quotes I shared with you in this episode. He would be feeling one way, experience this blink, a sudden loss of memory, and come back to conscious awareness sometime later. Dr. Dorothy Lewis, who had examined Sellers in 1987, had found him to be, quote, chronically psychotic, exhibiting symptoms of paranoid schizophrenia and other major mood disorders, end quote. She described how he was in poor touch with reality at times and was overwhelmed by fantasy. By 1992, the additional diagnosis was provided by three other mental health professionals. Sellers was diagnosed as having what was then called multiple personality disorder and is now known as dissociative identity disorder. MPD or DID is a somewhat controversial mental health condition characterized by the presence of two or more distinct personality identities in one individual. Each identity may have their own name, habits, interests, likes, and dislikes. One personality, or dominant alter, controls the individual's behavior and then may switch off with another personality as needed in order to cope with stressful or traumatic situations. It's believed that these splits in personality are created in response to trauma usually experienced during early childhood. The disorder can lead to gaps in memory from minutes to days and even longer periods when one personality has taken over control and the other or others are suppressed or dormant. The diagnosis of DID is rare and controversial within both psychiatry and the legal system, especially as it pertains to an insanity defense. Sellers was said to possess at least three alters or separate personalities, and possibly as many as eight. Even though this was newly discovered evidence in Sellers' case, and Oklahoma had a process for post-trial consideration of new evidence, the Oklahoma State Court of Appeals refused to consider it. In 1999, Sellers' appeal was heard by the 10th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals. They did consider the diagnosis of multiple personality disorder when weighing this case and stated their belief that Sellers was mentally ill during the time of the murders and possibly met the definition of legal insanity. However, they ruled that it was too late to raise this issue on appeal. But they did strongly chastise the Oklahoma Appeals Court for refusing to consider the diagnosis, along with, quote, several other mistakes they said the court made in Sellers' case. They recommended that the state court reconsider Sellers' case and or his petition for clemency. Sellers did file for clemency based on his mental health diagnosis and his work with Christian organizations while incarcerated, but the Pardon and Parole Board denied it. If clemency had been granted, Sellers would have been resentenced to life without the possibility of parole. The U.S. Supreme Court declined to take up Sellers' case. Sean Sellers' execution date was set for February 1999. His imminent execution was controversial and criticized by many in the United States and abroad. The American Bar Association disagreed with the practice of sentencing a person to death whose crime was committed while still a minor. Archbishop Desmond Tutu denounced Sellers' sentence as cruel and unusual punishment. 
He believes Seller's death sentence should be commuted due to his age at the time of the offense, as well as his religious work since his incarceration, which he cited as evidence of the young man's rehabilitation. He also cited the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, which reads, quote, Neither capital punishment nor life imprisonment without possibility of release shall be imposed for crimes committed by persons below 18 years of age, end quote. Archbishop Tutu sent a direct plea for Oklahoma Governor Frank Keating to commute Seller's sentence. But Governor Keating had run his campaign for office on a tough-on-crime and a pro-death penalty platform. Keating had publicly stated he would never consider commutation or clemency of an Oklahoma death sentence while he was in office. It was a moot point. Time ran out for Sean Sellers on February 4, 1999, the date set for his execution. For his last meal, he had Chinese food, egg rolls, sweet and sour shrimp, and batter fried shrimp. On hand to witness him die by lethal injection were seven members of Paul Lee Belafato's family. Sean Sellers had seven supporters who also attended, including two spiritual advisors. Sellers was strapped on a gurney in the death house of the Oklahoma State Penitentiary. Two IVs were inserted, one into each arm. A heart monitor was then attached to determine exactly when his heart stopped beating so the time of death could be established. When asked if he had any final words, Sean Sellers did not mention his parents nor apologize for taking the lives of his victims. He instead addressed those who were present to watch him die. Quote, all the people that are hating me right now and are here waiting to see me die, when you wake up in the morning, you're not going to feel any different. You're going to hate me just as much tomorrow as tonight. When you wake up and nothing has changed inside, reach out to God and he will be there for you. Reach out to God and he will heal you. Let him touch your hearts. Don't hate all your lives. I love you all. End quote. Sellers then sang the words of a contemporary Christian song. Set my spirit free that I might praise thee. Set my spirit free that I might worship thee. He then loudly exclaimed, Here I come, Father. I'm coming home. Finally, he addressed the warden, saying, Let's do it, Gary. Let's get it on. A series of drugs was then pumped into his veins, the first to render him unconscious, another to induce paralysis, and a third to stop his heart from beating. Sean Sellers was pronounced dead at 12.17 a.m., he was 29 years old. His ashes were scattered in the Colorado woods, as per his wishes. Sean Sellers remains the only person executed for a crime committed under the age of 17 since the death penalty was reinstated in the U.S. In 2005, the U.S. Supreme Court's decision in Roper v. Simmons declared it unconstitutional to execute an individual for a crime committed under the age of 18. It found that the execution of juveniles is in conflict with the Eighth Amendment and the Fourteenth Amendment, which deal with cruel and unusual punishment. In making their decision, the court cited a body of sociological and scientific research, finding that juveniles have a lack of maturity and sense of responsibility compared to adults. The decision also pointed out that adolescents were found to be overrepresented statistically in virtually every category of reckless behavior. The court further noted that in recognition of the comparative immaturity and irresponsibility of juveniles, almost every state prohibited those under age 18 from voting, serving on juries, or marrying without parental consent. The studies they cited also found that juveniles are more vulnerable to negative influences and outside pressures, including peer pressure, and have less control over their own environments than adults. A Christian book publisher released Seller's autobiography titled Web of Darkness in 1999, shortly before his execution. The families of Lee and Vonda Bellafato and Robert Bauer believed Sellers never truly repented for his crimes. They characterized his final words as arrogant and unapologetic. So how do we answer the question I put to you at the beginning of this episode? Was Sean Sellers demon-possessed, mentally ill, or simply a cold-blooded killer? The public overall was of two opinions. Either Sellers was a Satanist slash evil, and we must remember that the majority of the opinions seeking to put Sellers to death were his community members and residents of Oklahoma. Like I mentioned earlier, this is the Bible Belt, 
and their belief that Sean Sellers was a satanic killer would cause them to be more biased towards the harshest punishment. But even some of his supporters believed that Sellers had been under the influence of evil due to his involvement in Satanism, but they argued that he had been redeemed when he became a Christian. The second opinion was that Sellers was just a cold-blooded killer who wanted to be free of his parents. The prosecutor called him a thrill killer and said he just wanted freedom from his parents' rules. The question to that would be, free of his parents and then what? He was only 16 years old. What was his plan after that? If there was no plan, this would lend itself to the argument that Sean Sellers was living in a fantasy world and perhaps that was a sign of mental illness. But there was also the minority opinion. Those that wanted to save Sean Sellers' life argued that he was either mentally ill so he was not responsible for his actions or at least was too young to be sentenced to death for the crimes he committed. But some combination of these seems to me to make more sense. When we look at evidence for mental illness, he did show signs of delusion early on if we believe his accounts of hearing voices in his head, of believing that these were outside entities giving him messages. Now, were these due to abuse or not? They may have been and maybe not. There was a, a doctor's report while he was in prison showing evidence of a brain injury from the time he was probably very young. So it's possible that there was mental illness due to genetics or a brain injury or possibly some other combination of factors. We also know that Sean Sellers lived in a fantasy world. Many of his interests were slanted towards fantasy, the idea of becoming like a ninja of, of ancient times and having these skills, or the game Dungeons and Dragons, which most people now agree was not something dangerous, but it is steeped in fantasy. And young people love to immerse themselves in those types of stories. Sean Sellers was definitely a person who was drawn to fantasy, but he wasn't necessarily drawn to violence. We know that he balked at some of the violent acts that he claims his uncle and stepfather committed while hunting. As far as we can tell, the only violence that he committed before the murders had been towards himself. There were reports of self-mutilation like cutting. He also admitted that he had suicidal thoughts over the years as a preteen and a teen. But we didn't hear about him wanting to kill or commit homicide until just before the murders were carried out. But Sean Sellers did express a need for freedom and power. This is a normal expression of something that a child who is trying to mature and become an autonomous person would have a need for. But he also felt even less in control of his life due to all of the moving he had to do, being shuttled around to different relatives, not having a say in where he lived or who he lived with. And he expressed wanting to feel in control of his life as he grew older. The powerlessness also, I believe, came from this idea of manhood that he was trying to figure out as he became a teenager. He had at least two role models in his life, his uncle and his stepfather, who were Vietnam vets. His stepfather was a Green Beret. These were like the uber males of the species, if you want to call it that, who you know were the tough guys, who were the ones who came across probably to a young boy as very heroic and unafraid and tough and somebody that you know can't be messed with. Sean Sellers always said he felt less than, he felt weaker than, he felt like he was told he was a wimp and a baby. He wanted to emulate these male relatives, but never felt like he measured up. So when he began with his friend talking about fantasies, it turned into these dark discussions about revenge, power over others, and murder. But I would believe that it probably would have never gone so far if he had not found an accomplice who also shared these dark and violent fantasies. I also believe that Sean Sellers was highly impressionable due to a poor or weak sense of self. He was easily influenced and manipulated. Everything that he learned about, he immersed himself in. And he changed these interests very quickly when if somebody else was involved in them, he would become involved in them and he would immerse himself in them. And then he'd go on to the next thing. So whether it was the ninja stuff or Dungeons and Dragons or um, the occult I believe he was trying to find some sense of self, but he also was seeking approval of others. And then because he had this weak sense of self, he looked for a shell of protection in more dark interests. I don't believe Dungeons and Dragons was one of them. I think that was just a natural fantasy thing. You know, witchcraft or even some of this 
is not necessarily something that lends somebody towards violent acts or murder or a homicide or anything that's harmful. And this is what I believe Sean Sellers did, is he took a hodgepodge of all these things he had read about and learned about and thought he understood and then turned it into his own worldview and something he could escape into, into fantasy. But he was so like susceptible to this magical thinking. So for example, the rituals that he did, he thought would make him this different person, make him this person that was more confident and more in control. He thought he needed to make sacrifices in order to get power, either through Satan or other beliefs, even including Christianity, the switch, the transformation. He said he was a, quote, different person after accepting Christ. And this happened almost immediately after his arrest. Like I said, some people believed it was sincere. Some thought it was manipulative. But this was something that happened right after his arrest that he denounced Satan and now became a Christian. And now his worldview, again, completely shifted. So he probably believed himself to be sincere, and maybe he was. But it still seems like he did not have a full grasp of reality. His extensive writing about God's love and redemption were very detailed, but he wrote about no deep insights into what had led him to kill his parents. All he said was that he was led astray by false beliefs about Satanism, but he didn't at all talk about his trauma as a child, his psychological issues, or any of those things. It probably would have taken him many more years and included therapy with psychologists to explore these issues. And this time he didn't have before being executed at age 29. One thing that did come out is that he did come to understand that many of his, quote, supporters had exploited him for their own agendas. He wrote about this in some of his journal writings before he was executed. He said those who wanted to use him as a warning for others who dabbled in occult and Satanism would twist his story around to fit their narrative. He said that those who knew his story, knew that it would draw viewers in to their television shows, books, etc., would talk to him, interview him, but then would alter the message or the way it was presented to make it come out a different way that was not in his experience. So he became a little bit embittered by this towards the end, that he was still being exploited by other adults in his mind were using him for their own agenda or to reach their own goals. Sean Sellers died, I believe, before he was able to form a solid sense of his own identity. He was unable to form any stable connections or be grounded in one place long enough to form a core group of peers or have enough time to pursue hobbies or interests in a meaningful way to find his role or purpose in his family and community. As a result, he was highly suggestible to any flights of fantasy and would then form an unhealthy obsession even within innocent pursuits. However, most likely because he experienced depression, he became more fixated on darker practices, topics, and subjects, dark fantasies, violence, etc. He may never have acted on these violent thoughts, or perhaps they would have turned inward and he may have become suicidal, but he was unlucky enough to make a friend who also indulged in violent fantasies, and together, he and Richard Howard formed a folie adieu, or a madness shared by two. I've covered a few notable cases of this phenomenon in this podcast before. You can listen to episodes 100 and 101 about the Parker Hill murder case or episodes 131 and 132 about the Gibbon sisters case for more on this. Together, Sean Sellers and Richard Howard egged each other on. Had they not met like other infamous duos such as the Hillside Stranglers, Leonard Lake and Richard Eng, or the Toolbox Killers, these crimes may have never occurred. But Sean Sellers killed his parents alone, you may be thinking. And this is where we may cross over from mentally ill and gullible to angry and wanted revenge, like the prosecutors claimed. I do believe Sean Sellers was loved by his family. His mother was very young when she had him, and I believe she did her best she could to raise him. Maybe some would consider her standards subpar, maybe not. But she didn't totally abandon him. She didn't just leave him for others to raise. That's why he was moved around so much, because she kept her son with her as much as she could. His stepfather also treated him like a son. Lee had other children who love him to this day and say he was a wonderful man. I believe he did his best to raise his stepson as his own, although I think they were very different people and it made it hard for them to connect sometimes. 
When Vonda was given the paper by the English teacher that was written by her son and read his words about being a Satanist and how he felt he could kill without remorse, she herself sat down and wrote a six-page letter to her son. Unfortunately, I could not find a copy or text from it, but it's reported that she wrote to tell Sean how much she loved him, and I assume warned him that these types of thoughts were dangerous. I'm sure she was very concerned for Sean and tried her best to connect with him as his mother. She gave him this letter just hours before her son shot her and ended her life. I do not know if he had read her letter before carrying out the murder of his parents. So part of his motivation could have been anger towards his parents for curtailing his freedom or getting in the way of seeing the girl he loved. These are normal frustrations teens sometimes have with their parents, but they don't normally murder them for it. So the question remains, was Sean Sellers evil, demonically possessed, mentally ill, a cold-blooded killer, or a combination of some or all of these? What do you think? That will do it for this episode of Once Upon a Crime. We're just kicking off Spooky Month, so come back next week for another chapter of The Devil Made Me Do It. The next episode is really strange and creepy, so don't miss it. Follow or subscribe on your favorite podcast app. Check us out on TikTok. I'll be adding more What the Crime videos. Follow at OUAC Pod. We also just kicked off a new Patreon offering, Once Upon a Book Club. I just shared a live stream to discuss the first portion of the book, Victim, The Other Side of Murder by Gary Kinder. You can join us for these live chats or watch it later by becoming a Patreon member. To find out more and join, go to patreon.com slash once upon a crime. Once Upon a Crime is written, produced, and edited by me, Esther Ludlow. Research and final audio mix for this episode was by Lorena Garcia. Until next time, be good to one another. <laughs>